Okay, everyone, and welcome to one more of our webinars. And this time, um, we're here to talk about uh, performance, productivity, culture. And I know this has interested a lot of you, but going just by the number of people who registered for this webinar. But before we come to that, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, just a couple of words about the Learning in OT Roundtable. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Sujaya Banerjee, and I'm the founder of the Learning in OD Roundtable. Uh, this forum was created about 10 years ago. Um, we are a group of curious learners. We come together to be able to focus on, um, on masterclasses and various other formats of discussions and debates and, and learning to be able to enable, um, to, um, enable personal transformation and enable professionals in the HR learning OD talent fraternities to be able to go back and drive organizational transformation and build learning organizations. Um, this has been a very incredible journey of 10 years. We started with 13 members. We now have 22,000 members across five cities. Um, since the lockdown, the Learning OD Roundtable has been bringing you very outstanding, learn from home, cutting edge learning webinars. Uh, so a lot of our learning events are now happening virtually. Um, so it allows us to be able to include people from just about anywhere. So it doesn't restrict you to be able to operate or to be able to access our services only from five cities. But on the other side of the lockdown, and we do when we, we, when we are allowed to congregate into in-person meetings, um, I welcome you to join uh, one of our in-person masterclasses in a city closest to you. Um, move forward, I want to be able to describe the people who are, you know, uh, the wind below our wings here at the Learning and OD Roundtable. Here's our very incredible governing council. Dr. Akhil Basrai, who most of you probably already know from Akhil Basrai Consulting, Adil Malia, who runs the firm, Srinivas Venkatram from Illumine Labs, Rajesh uh, Padmanabhan, uh, who is a transformational leader, Dr. Sujaya Banerjee, that's myself from Capstone People Consulting, uh, Manu Vadhva from Sony uh, Pictures, Dr. Prince Augustine from Mahindra uh, and Mahindra, Rajesh Rupatya, who's the director of um, the Academy of Applied Emotional Intelligence, and Rajesh Kamat, uh, who also leads and is the founder of More Than HR. So I'm sure most of you know him. Please move forward. I want to be able to take this opportunity to be able to invite you to become members of the Learning and OT Roundtable. Move forward, please. Um, and we have some very incredible membership options. Um, you can join individually as a member. You can join as a corporate member. Uh, the huge discounts that are going on through the lockdown, you get access to a lot of freebies, including a performance and productivity app, which is being offered pro bono to members of the Learning and OD Roundtable. Um, we have the HR response team, which is a pro bono service of experts. Um, we are offering this pro bono for everyone only in the month of May, post which only paid members will continue to get access to uh, the services of the HR response team. Um, we have an incredible a learning resource center that we will launch shortly, which is also an app, uh, which gives you access to a whole host of learning resources um, if you are indeed a paid member. Uh, the corporate membership allows you to be able to have rotating 10 memberships. So I encourage and invite all of you to be able to come in either individually or come in um, as, uh, as corporate members and access the very many facilities, including huge discounts on the um, LNOD Roundtable Academy programs, many of which are being offered virtually. Move forward. Um, Zippy, this is uh, um, our association with People Strong to be able to access uh, this work management platform. It allows you to manage productivity and is extremely important, especially when you're trying to drive performance through the lockdown. I recommend strongly that you reach out to the LNOD Roundtable team to know more about Zippy. Move forward. Um, this is our HR response service. This is incredible list of experts with 25 plus years of experience uh, whose services are available for free. This is the advice is available for free. So do access us if you have a query. We've, we've done this for over 40 organizations in the last five, six weeks. I recommend strongly that you reach out to this group of experts. If you have a query and you would like another point of view or perspective, please come in on board to be able to use the COVID-19 um, crisis people management, people, people response uh, team. And this is an incredible group of experts who you must access as you're, as you're trying to navigate so many challenges 
through these very difficult times. Move forward. Um, the virtual learning hub, this is coming up soon and I recommend strongly that you come in as paid members and access this. Move forward. The best diversity and inclusion practices of Asia study. Um, we launched this uh, a while ago. These dates are now extended. I recommend strongly that you uh, that you participate in the best diversity inclusion practices of Asia. There are 13 categories in which we are inviting entries. Um, so please come in on board and uh, share your best practices. And um, hopefully uh, on the other side of the lockdown, um, when, they, when it is going to be possible, we'll try and have a seminar where we present best practices and also have the awards. Uh, but do keep the entries coming. I know there's been a lift in the number of entries that we've got through the lockdown. So keep this going as you have the bandwidth to be able to perhaps put your practices down on paper and participate in this incredible study uh, called the Best Diversity and Inclusion Practices of Asia. Move forward. And today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the third in our talent management series uh, of webinars. And this time around, we're going to look at culture, performance, and productivity, how HR learning can be at the vanguard of change. And to be able to have this incredible conversation today together, and I'm going to encourage all of you to participate by using your chat box to be able to express your views, your opinions, your questions. You'll see this little box, you can post your questions. You can also post them on the chat box, direct, the, direct them to a specific panelist so that in the last 15 minutes of this conversation, we're able to pull in uh, some of you in the audience to, pull, to get you to interact directly with the panelists and ask your questions to the panelists of your choice. So we'll get some more interaction going in the last 15 minutes. For now, I want you to be uh, uh, to to kind of um, to kind of sit back as I take you through the incredible panelists uh, who are going to participate in the conversation here with us. We have TV Rao here, Chairman of TV Rao Learning Systems, also Professor at I'm Amphibad. Uh, TV Rao, I don't believe anybody here in the audience doesn't know him. He's been the father of human resource development, the way he's been described. Um, he's an incredible author. He's very humble with the very brief um, introduction that he's asked us to make. He's been the Dean of IIM Ahmedabad at one point in time. And um, he, he does some real incredible work, continues to be so contemporary. I recommend very strongly that a lot of you follow him and we have the incredible privilege of having him on this uh, webinar today. So welcome, Dr. Rao. Um, next, I'd like to introduce you all to Rajesh Padmanabhan. Um, you know, he's a senior business transformation leader, has very many years of experience having been with ICICI Bank, had, uh, you know, led uh, HR in organizations like Cap Germany and Wells Fund. Um, he is an incredible thinker, um, is a digital expert, um, has um, a great uh, perspective, point of view, very well-rounded in all that he does. And we are delighted to have him on this panel. So when we talked about culture, productivity, and performance, I couldn't think of anybody else other than Rajesh Padmanabhan coming in on, on board. He has some very pertinent views, and I'm delighted that today we have the opportunity to hear him. So welcome on board, Rajesh. Um, next, uh, we've got Shobha Pandey. Shobha is talent management and diversity and inclusion lead um, for India, China, Asia at John Deere. Uh, she is uh, a mathematics graduate and is an HR professional with over 18 years of experience. Um, she has an in incredible uh, portfolio of experiences and is also an India Council member at the Society of Women Engineers. And we're really delighted to be able to have Shobha on board. So please join me in welcoming Shobha Pandey of John Deere on this uh, conversation today. Move forward. Uh, next is Bosco de Mello. Uh, I'm not sure many of you would have heard of him uh, in the past, but we're very interested and very excited to introduce the speaker, um, you know, on our forum today. Um, Bosco is the chief executive and lead consultant, uh, Conscious Development, uh, which is the name of his organization. He's been a consultant, facilitator and coach. Uh, he developed um, uh, Conscious Development as an organization about 10 years ago. Um, you know, Bosco has an incredible repertoire of work, a very significant part of it outside the country in the United States, which is the reason why I said maybe many of you would not have seen him on the speaker circuit before. Uh, he holds a master's degree in positive organization development and change from Case Western Reserve University, has a bachelor's degree in economics and statistics. He's also, his background is also advertising and marketing. 
So we're very excited to have him on board. Uh, he's done lots of interesting courses uh, through MIT Sloan and very many leading educational institutions in the United States. Uh, Bosco, it's really a privilege to be able to have you on board. Join us as we try to navigate, uh, all of us try to navigate and make sense of the incredible times that we're existing in. So welcome, Bosco. Uh, last um, but not the least, Anuradha Mishra, Head of Talent and Learning, Marsh Mechelen Companies. Anuradha hold, uh, heads the Talent and Learning uh, Vertical for JLT India, which is now part of Marsh Mechelen. Um, and OD uh, and Talent Management Leader, she's worked on a very wide spectrum of projects spanning change management and transitions, leadership development, development centers, uh, potential assessment and succession planning, and so on. Um, uh, you know, Anuradha, you know, has played a very stellar role in mobilizing a very large group of people uh, into work, of home, work from home recently. And I'm sure her insights around some of the questions that we have today will help many of you who've logged in uh, to be able to understand how to get our arms around some of the incredible challenges that we're seeing emerge in these times. Um, should we move forward? All right. Um, can we bring the uh, Sunit, uh, everybody's cameras or, uh, on and get all our speakers uh, right the center stage. So can you all please unmute yourself? Can I request all the panelists to please, please un unmute yourselves? So um, Anuradha, TV Rao, Rajesh Padmanabhan, Bosco, Shobha Pandey, uh, all of you welcome back. Can you please switch on your videos? Can I request you to switch on your videos please? Shobha, can we unmute? Can we unmute and switch on Shobha's video? Hi, Shobha. Shobha, are you able to hear us? Hi, Sujaya. Yes, I am. All right. Is your video on? Is, is it possible to get your video on? Yes, uh, I just, can you see me now? No, not yet. So maybe it'll come in in, in uh, a minute. It's fluctuating connection. I have... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. We'll wait till it's on on. No, it's all right. That no, it's not on yet. So let it come when your connection's better. For now, we want to make sure we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, all of you. I mean, you know, you've uh, both Shobha and uh, Anuradha, your your practitioners. Uh, you know, until recently, Rajesh, uh, you know, you've been a very, very active, uh, you know, practitioner at the vanguard of all the change that you're driving inside your organizations. Um, Dr. T.V. Rao, I know that you have a pulse on everything that's happening across the board. So many people reach out to you for advice and for support. Um, and Bosco, I know that this is incredible for you because you've just come back to India only six months ago. Uh, but you can see all that is unraveling around you. Uh, so I'm going to start by being able to refer to the article that we sent out to everyone as a pre-read. Is HR too fragile? And I think this is Visti Banaji's very outstanding article where he's questioning uh, clearly uh, whether HR has acted fast enough and bravely enough in the midst of this very incredible unprecedented crisis. I think that uh, whenever there is a crisis of this kind that involves, uh, which kind of throws the organization, I mean, in our, some of our previous uh, webinars, we kind of established that no one could have been fully prepared, notwithstanding your disaster management plans or the emergency response plans. Nobody could really have thought of this kind of a reaction to a global pandemic. And so notwithstanding the fact that we take cover around not being prepared enough, even if we saw it coming, uh, I think when, when, when most of the business challenges was, you know, were obviously taking precedence over what was happening with people, what was clearly happening was that people were being mobilized to work from home. And even as you, were, as you were trying to close out the challenges around the business, people were operating in a lockdown from home. So in, a, in this kind of um, helpless kind of um, uh, feeling that kind of say, sinks in, there's fear, there's anxiety galore. You don't know what this really means for you, your career, your organization, uh, and the rest of that. It's not uncommon to want to really reach out to HR for support. Um, and I think what Visti uh, sort of uh, sketches in his article in a, in a very sort of unabashed uh, way with deep candor is that in most organizations, HR was ca caught either napping behind the wheel or perhaps like an ostrich putting its head down, burying his head into the sand 
uh, pretending that they don't quite know what's really going on. There are incredible stories uh, from people across organizations on how HR didn't act fast enough, did not assert enough, did not act as the people champion, and, um, and, and essentially let people down quite significantly in the midst of this crisis. I want to try and get some reactions from all of you on what is your view, what exactly is going on, um, you know, are we, are we people who don't have the courage to do what it is that we're supposed to do within organizations or have we just reduced ourselves collectively to order takers? I'm starting with the most difficult question first. You want in some sequence or anyone can answer? No, just anyone can answer this. Okay. I, I uh, read this article with uh, great interest and I thought it's very timely. Uh, 15 years ago, there was a, an, a similar article, uh, Why We Hate HR. Hmm. I am reminded of that. And I don't, I think the article depicts that not much has changed. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, the most important thing that HR should do is to, I mean, HR is not like anybody else. For me, I put HR, if you are real, true HR person, even far above the medical profession. Medical profession today, all health professionals are taking care of the health and uh, agility of human beings, hygiene of the human beings. Very important. You can see how much of respect they are getting everywhere. Even the prime minister asks at a particular point of time, clap for them and so on. Now, a couple of weeks after that, I think we, the country faces a dilemma, life, saving lives versus livelihood. Now, for HR, it has both. You have to save lives of these workmen who are working in this. So you have to make sure all that is applicable to the rest of the citizens are applicable to your employees. Wear the mask, make sure. I think with these last five points, if you look at, I think at the end he says, most important thing, make medical health available. Take care of people if they have already been. So you have to take care of what the health professionals are doing. And you also take care of the livelihoods. So this is a very complex job, no doubt about it. And that's the reason why, I mean, I, I uh, feel good that 30 years ago, I wrote this book, HRD Missionary. And I believe that if you have to be a real good HR person, you have to be a missionary. A missionary does not, missionary sacrifices his or her own welfare, welfare of the rest of the people. Even if you don't go to that level, I think that is what Visti suggested. Can you work with your top management and get them to slash their salaries before you ask anybody else to leave? I think that is the level to which HR could have grown and they would have got a phenomenally high kind of a respect. But what we have done, I'm very unfortunately, we don't have statistics, but I wish somebody collects a lot of data about it. I don't think we have lived up to this, except maybe in a few cases. There are a few cases where I assume HR is working. This may be maybe two, three percent. Uh, I'm any person I give will speak more about my attitude to HR rather than the truth. But I think nobody has done any kind of research. It's a great opportunity. I think post-liberalization was a great opportunity for HR. HR should have been in the forefront to be, become knowledge managers. But if you look at what IT has done, IT has set HR aside and brought somebody else as knowledge manager. I mean, there can't be a better knowledge manager than HR. We lost one. 2008 crisis, we lost another opportunity. Now, COVID, I think I don't find anyone talking about this is a great thing HR has done. Even some of the HR guys who are talking about what is happening in their companies are referring back to how their CEO. So that means the CEO has got to be the first HR manager. Very unfortunate because I think we should be training the CEOs to be compassionate, to be empathetic, to look at people with a lot of respect and say, it is these people who can make a lot, lot, lot of difference for you and take you into the future. So I like this article, wonderful article. I think uh, it should provoke us rather than to evaluate the writer. I would think that we should get provoked and we should chuck out a uh, future course of action for our lives. Good point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. I'm going to move this over to Rajesh. Rajesh, what do you think is going on? Do you think that HR chose to save itself than its people? I think it's a great article, number one. I think the first point that I would definitely want to mention the article well, Prop did 
mention about Rajesh will not able to hear you very clearly. Rajesh, I think that's a poor connection. Perhaps you know, to repeat some part. Alright, can't hear you clearly. I think the audience is not able to hear you as well. Article says uh, it's clearly at the stage of an opportunity. Rajesh, we are not Rajesh, we are not able to hear you. During lockdown or pre lockdown, Rajesh, post lockdown, there are Rajesh, we are not able to hear you. Uh, I'm sorry, can you can you hear me? No, now? no, we can you. Sujia, can you go to the next one? You know, I'll try and improve my connection. Yes, 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 I'm please. Trying, yeah. Sujia, I'm trying, Sujia. I'm Yes, can yes, you, no worries. Is there, is no, there, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I think we'll just wait. We'll just wait to hear from him. Yeah, he'll um, just to let the audience know we'll come back to him. He has a poor connection. Let's move this over to um, Shobha. Should we move over to you? What is your reaction to the article? Yes, uh, Sujia, I think, uh, first of all, I think the article is very. And I completely agree with uh, TV sir that it's very, very timely as well. Uh, I have a little differing view on, I think, what more could, not only the article, but I think what the HR fraternity needs to look into. And uh, which is that HR professionals cannot forget that they themselves are human. Uh, in the current COVID situation or the kind of crisis we are in, it's once in a lifetime kind of situation we are in. It's imp important we acknowledge uh, uh, Self-care is key. So I think it's important to acknowledge and be human and to acknowledge our own vulnerabilities. I think that's something which is extremely important and is at the forefront when it comes to HR leading change, uh, kind of uh, jumping onto these opportunities. Uh, so that's my very quick take on that uh, you have to be vulnerable and being vulnerable is about demonstrating that vulnerability. I mean, talking about it openly and acknowledging it and then of course uh, i mean Christy has some great uh, recommendations in the article uh, i think besides that i i would surely add there that uh, it is important that hr is acknowledging this and reaching out to the right experienced resources to combat the situation and getting the expert opinion in the organization whether it is from people uh, very senior in the hierarchy or in the organization or elsewhere who have experience of such uh, pandemics or for that matter crisis situation. Uh, so I think bringing all that together and we will talk about culture in a while will be extremely yes. critical but most important be human to acknowledge uh, that human resources will have their own uh, challenges and kind of combating that. I'll pause there Sujaya. I know you want to go back to the next uh, panelist. Yes, yes. So I want to get Anuradha's view on this. Anuradha, what was your reaction? Shobha, I think very pertinent points and we will loop it back to some of the other questions coming up. But meanwhile, keen to hear what is Anuradha's reaction to this article. Yeah, thanks, Sujaya. So uh, after reading the article, there were certain uh, points which kind of uh, resonated with me very strongly. Uh, one thing which I definitely believe that resourcelessness for HR is a boom. A lot of times HR professionals do not push themselves to look at ways of working which can uh, uh, which are not in situations of abundance. And I think this has been a perfect time for HR to really step forward, look at how you work in innovative ways and how do you make yourself available to organizations. Now, when I say organization, I don't only mean the employees of an organization, but to leaders as well. I'm sure, you know, most of the leaders, at least in my experience, when I have spoken to leaders, they're so caught up with the entire question of how do I become more productive. Leaders may also lose track of how they are communicating with people, how they are being compassionate to people, how they are reaching out uh, at all times and what decisions they are taking, whether they are impacting people positively or negatively. As custodians of culture of an organization, as the voice of employees, and as the head of the, uh, you know, if you look at an organization as a body, uh, the, the mind of an organization, I feel HR has a very, very strong uh, role to play. A lot of our HR uh, professionals, as Vishti had mentioned in his article, is that a lot of them have not taken that role simply because uh, uh, HR has been relegated to a very facilitator kind of an organization uh, uh, status. 
uh, it's also time for HR to say that whether we're facilitators or are we real business professionals? And if we are real business professionals, we need to understand how business works. We need to understand what really goes around the business and how people uh, generate business. And we need to support all aspects of business. It just can't be only process or only people. It has to be everything. Right. So, you know, we're already getting a few participants uh, mentioning in the chat that, uh, you know, first of all, some of them don't have the pre-read. So I'm just letting you know that because it's it come in last minute and they don't have the pre-read. This is an article that we're referring to called is HR Too Fragile. It got featured in People Matters and Bispi Banerjee is the author of this article. We had sent it out as pre-read to all the panelists and to all the participants who were registered. We just posted it on the uh, chat. So for those of you who have not had an ac uh, access to this before, please refer to it. It's a longish article. So I'd recommend don't start reading it now, but you can refer to it, post this. Uh, I also chanced upon a couple of other, um, you know, messages which said that, uh, you know, HR is everyone's favorite beating boy. So, you know, saying that HR has done this or HR didn't do it or HR has failed is a little bit lopsided and that, um, you know, he's of the opinion that there have been people who managed this transition very well. I won't be able to respond to that to say that most certainly yes. And I think even when we've spoken to each other, or even in the, um, in the uh, you know, the start, I did mention that there have been organizations who've done this well, but there's large numbers of organizations that believe that they got let down. I'm going to start with the questions. And for those of you who still have these questions on, is HR everyone's favorite beating boy? You know, pause with that question. We'll come up with it in some time. All right. Um, so I won't be able to start by being able to ask, you know, I think one of the biggest transitions organizations manage um, at this time has been around the work from home. So if we look at change management, that was indeed the biggest change that you really needed to manage. And yet there are very significantly large number of organizations that claim there is no work from home policy. They've not been asked to sign any agreement. There's nothing that's been done um, in, in terms of wanting to protect the data. Even that kind of, those kind of initiatives are not in place yet. They're still thinking about it. There's some organizations in parts have done some training on work from home, but by and large, they've not focused on the real group because work happens top down. So the creamy layer is the one that really needs to be groomed around this. And I think for some reason, they've been left out of the training or it's been planned for them, not yet done even in the sixth week of a lockdown. I just want some reactions from you on this. What is your own view on how this has been managed? I mean, HR was right in the center of this work from, work from home transition. I understand some organizations have actually told people that there is no performance management right now. Don't worry about it. Just continue working as usual, as and get the job done. And then severely complaining around productivity. I'm just wondering about these mixed messages that are going out to people when you tell them that performance doesn't matter at this time. And then you want productivity and you're very upset because you're not getting productivity. We have a large number of people in the LNOD roundtable who've reached out to us saying, is there any way in which we can get people to become more accountable for what they're doing from home? Because ranging from, I don't have connectivity, right down to, I'm unable to work on my own, uh, right down to, there are just too many complications. It's too complex, complicated for me to be able to do this without support that I was used to doing this as a team and, you know, I feel isolated now and I'm unable to do this on, on, on our own. By and large, the feeling is that work has slackened. There's lower accountability. How do we build back the seriousness around what we're trying to do? And when we get down to asking some basic questions, do you have a policy? Did you get people to sign an agreement? Did you set the ground rules to be able to make this happen? All this that people count on, which are the building blocks that people count on from HR are sadly missing. I just want to try and get, you know, we've got practitioners on this group and the others. Um, I'm going to ask uh, both uh, Anuradha and, and, and Shobha to go first. Yeah, what is your reaction to this? Even if you've managed this part well in your own organization, what's your reaction to this? Would you hold HR accountable for this? Or do you think this is the general leadership challenge that you have within organizations where we're expecting people to just know how to work from home organically? Um, so uh, I can I can go first, Sujaya. I I think at dear can you all hear me clear because I'm facing some connectivity issues. So excuse me yeah, for that. No, can we, you hear me? We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I can go first. I think I can talk about uh, my organization. We never had a work from home policy, and work from home is not a new term for us. Uh, I think we had a work from home guidelines, 
I think the more and more we worked around it, especially in HR and managers, we did realize it is more about the manager-employee relationship and the trust which is there uh, among the manager and the employee for that whole relationship and the equation to work when the employee is working from home. So that and this is this has been on for us for the last 10, 12 years now. We have had these guidelines. So we really did not need a policy. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, managers were very comfortable because in the tech technology center environment, surprisingly, we had union meetings on virtual platforms. Uh, so I think it's about the culture. And I, I'm extremely proud, Fuja, as you were introducing earlier, that the organization culture plays a huge role in what uh, ABC write-up and hand-holding HR needs to do. For us, we were very lucky where uh, we did not need to do that. And things seamlessly transitioned. We were at 80% productivity in the first week itself. And only get us getting better and worse in pockets because depending on the type of business we are in. So I'll pause here. We've not had any uh, discipline issues or any challenges on manager-employee relationship front as far as work is concerned. But yes, we are doing some detailed work around uh, you know, making the process of goal setting and goals review much more robust, which will help managers and employees alike. Super. Uh, uh, Adhuraga, do you want to go next? Yes, of course. So, Sujaya, very similar to Shobha, I haven't had uh, an experience where work from home hasn't worked for us. We also had a policy, but it was a very uh, restricted policy with a lot of boundaries. I think this, uh, uh, you know, as soon as the lockdown started, it was also time for us to bust our own myths of saying why a work from home policy will not work. So before when leadership would sit down, they would have multiple issues around data security. They would have issues of trusting people and saying whether they would be able to work, productivity issues. Surprisingly, when we started working from home from the first week itself, um, we saw productivity go up. So while only 85% of the organization was working, the productivity continued to be at 100%, which was definitely meaning that the accountability that people were showing in these situations was much higher than they would in the office, right? The fact that you were not being the micromanaged impacted their own sense of responsibility uh, very positively. So whether you have a work from home policy or not should not ideally um, uh, be guiding your uh, ways of working in a, uh, you know, in a situation like this where you're sitting in lockdown. Uh, in terms of uh, um, the kind of support that we give in work from home, I think a lot has to be done from the leadership as well. Yeah, while the leadership uh, may say that we would like to work from home, there has to be a very strong sense of trust which has to be built in the organization. And that is something which our organization did extremely well. Uh, we started preparing for the lockdown much before the lockdown started. So two weeks before or a week before lockdown started, we were already working from home. We knew something would happen. There was a lot of foresight which HR was showing then as well to say that if something happens, how, how ready are you? Yeah, so um, my, my point would be that, uh, uh, you know, when you're looking at work from home, and whether we are wanting to assess our readiness, it has to be a, a lot of foresight that goes in, the trust that we built in the organization, and generally the leadership culture. Right. Um, Rajesh, I want to bring you in here, um, you know, to be able to share what is your sense on the kind of intentionality, clarity that a leader needs to have to be able to get the productivity that organizations are shouting out loud for? Because, you know, I must say that Anuradha's organization and Shobas is quite the outlier example. There are lots of organizations that claim that they didn't manage the transition well. We run, we run an HR response center um, that is also dealing with um, uh, queries, questions, asking for support from very large organizations as well. Uh, I'm going to come to the uh, managing manpower reduction separately in terms of how professionally that was managed. But I wanted to start with work from home and I want to try and get your sense on how does an organization convey intentionality and and, and, and is this, do you see this as a function of the leader's clarity rather than a process set up by HR? Yeah, uh, so yeah, first and foremost, uh, are you able to hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is this better? Oh, great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, I think uh, I'll allude to what, uh, you know, both, both my previous speakers did mention. Mm -hmm. But having said this, I think we were, we were, though we were all caught napping as far as work from home was concerned, and particularly it being matured only in IT services and the consulting outfits, 
rest of us were possibly not exposed to the amount of you know the the preparedness that one would have anticipated to happen but having yes. said this i think the way the community responded the way the workforce responded the way the entire organization responded to this i'm sure it's been a revolution of sorts uh, and all of us have learned a huge amount of uh, uh, upside from this i want to break this uh, question of yours into three parts uh, i think where uh the entire aspect has been a good and where where this possible low and I want to break it up a little objectively as well i think the culture part of it and the capabilities part of it have been a real wow as far as uh, you know work from home and the entire remote connectivity and tel- telecommuting is concerned i think that's worked very well the real challenge has been when it comes down to the discussion with third c culture capability and the third c that i describe as contribution for the first time hr is right now in the center of discussions where there is a convergence of business centricity and people centricity and right. it's right now in the thick of it and you're not physically out there i think discussions around i, I remember anu did mention i think the discussions around business growth profitability cash and 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 the entire aspect of market cap all of that become very prominent so when we you know when we're saying that we will deal with people first uh, we have to deal with this entire situation of people first and similar to how we would have treated a customer uh, care or a customer centric situation only when the two of them come to a, to you know to a point of uh, convergence then the stress level starts coming down uh, or the stress levels can start going up because the discussions can go either way i think this is possibly the first time and that's the reason we keep saying unprecedented when we're saying people first i think people first but at the same time the business is also very closely shadowing some of those hard stuff will need to be discussed and that is where the aspect of you know the entire the third c that i mentioned of contribution really starts taking a little bit of peak and post covid or post covidization i think this intensity at which we're going to talk about some of those hard data and quantifiable stuff will start taking some of the aspects which are like never seen before so i think that's where the stress levels are start coming coming in and when we don't have faces to connect and particularly when we're all at, at remote uh, remotely functioning this problem is little accentuated and that's where you know uh, this article with these article takes you know huge amount of sense state but yeah. it's also an opportunity as i see yeah. it's also right. a huge opportunity oh yes most certainly so i'm going to now direct the questions to both bosco and dr rao um, you know i think the for the organization that did manage to make this transition and settle in i think the first thing that a lot of organizations did was to be able to look at how to use some of the downtime um and i know that there has been long hours for lots of teams and um you know the, the fact that you're now slowed down is a myth for many organizations because you're actually working perhaps harder because you don't have you know there is perhaps lack of familiarity on on working in these formats uh, teams need to have multiple iterations to be able to get the job done so teams are still pivoting around how to work without being congregated in the same place without getting access to each other as easily so it could just mean more work which it is indeed for um several teams but there are lots of groups which kind of by virtue of the roles they perform have lesser to do and i think there's been a tendency to be able to uh, go all out to say can we can we roll out learning resources to these groups and um, there's just been this unprecedented rise on of webinars and other kind of all kinds of self styled consultants who have put out all kinds of webinars on productivity and um, uh, you know personality development and there's somebody a whole whole series of them around time management yoga all kinds of things that are that are available now so it's a very overcrowded space and i understand that some of the organizations have made some of these webinars mandatory for their people uh, so that and they're very generic in in the way in which the content it's all stuff that's already available also about some of the online content which was already available for organizations has been put out and it's kind of been made mandatory i want to be able to get your reactions on this because i think there appears to be a um, uh, a kind of illusion of getting people constructively engaged through learning especially when you don't know how to make them contribute in any other way and this time round i'm obviously referring more to the mid and the junior levels within organizations maybe in parts even at senior levels where there is a tendency to want to 
dole out learning resources to people, most of them seem very generic in their content. So just want to get a reaction to this, um, keeping people engaged through learning, which was point number two, after can we get them settled through work from home? Uh, the next stage was, can we get them to use some time uh, for learning? So what is your, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What has been your experience? What's your reaction to generic learning resources being made available to people? Um, you know, uh, give me a reaction to how learning is being handled with, inside organizations. Dr. Rao, it's, also, it's also in a virtual format, just adding, it's in a virtual format and, uh, and it's self-directed. So it's got many angles to what, the way in which perhaps a lot of um, individuals are not used to learning. So, but a lot of online uh, virtual content that's now made available to teams. Dr. Rao, would you like to or should I? Did you want to react first? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Bosco, go ahead. Okay, Bosco, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Rao. So, uh, so Jeff, one of the you know one of the first things that I've observed is that one of the big myths that has been busted uh, with the work from home, uh, you know, the whole scenario is the work-life balance. Earlier we you know, we would crib that people are spending too much time at office and, uh, you know, and that's uh, causing an imbalance with working from home. And now we actually see, uh, when I talk to some of my clients, they're working harder than ever before. You know, whether it's team meetings, whether it's going into overdrive to keep connected with teams across geographies, uh, whether it's uh, just keeping people engaged, they're working harder and longer hours. So work from home is certainly you know, while it is the need of the hour and it is serendipitous in the sense that we've had no choice in a, in case of a lot of industries to do this, we really have to take a long, hard look at how are we going to make this work from home policy uh, productive so that it doesn't end up being a, a solution that's worse than the problem that created it. That's number one. Number two is that you're absolutely right. What we're seeing is... Uh, Uberization now of webinars and all kinds of learning resources literally being thrown at people. On the one hand, we you know we know that learning is the new competitive advantage. Everything is getting disrupted. COVID nineteen has disrupted even disruption. And uh, the question is now: Can we learn faster than the environment is changing? Otherwise, we'll just be getting better and better at playing yesterday's game. So, right. but what we are seeing is there is a lot of quantity uh, in overdrive, you know, all kinds of webinars, all kinds of learning resources, some of which you mentioned being put in. But I think what is incumbent on talent management, HR, learning and development is to make a distinction between capability building and capacity building. And what do I mean by the difference? I mean by capability building is that it's about building new skills, new technologies, uh, new ways of doing the job better. And that's certainly where most of the discussion is happening. How do we reskill people? How do we upskill them? How do we get them to do job better and more productive, etc.? And what COVID-19 is actually pointing us to is also to look at capacity building, which is to look at the mindset of people. Are they able to reframe what's going on? Are they able to do more with what they already know? How are they going to sort of function in an environment where you don't know where the big, next big disruption is going to go on? And if you look at, um, you know, the article that Vesti Banaji has talked about, uh, he's talking about anti-fragility. Anti-fragility is about emerging stronger. It's not about resilience. It's about emerging stronger. The question that we have to ask is, the learning that is being provided right now, the opportunities for learning and the webinars, are they going to enable people to emerge stronger? Or are they just going to, you know, in a way, tell people, okay, we've learned something new, but are we prepared for what's going to come? The world is going to change. You know, we don't know where the disruption is going to come from. Are we prepared? Do we have the mindset to navigate what's going to come our way? Or are we still playing yesterday's game? So, in a sense for leadership, also the challenge is before we knew, we, before we learn anything new, we have to unlearn what we know. And that is devilishly hard. 
because you have to unlearn your uh, you know your old order your old way of knowing things and be open to there's a new way that the new business models going to emerge there are new challenges that are going to emerge there are new uh, you know challenges from the entire ecosystem whether it's a suppliers whether it's it's the environment whether your different constituents how are you going to be able to deal with those challenges and find answers to problems that are not yet on the horizon and that to my mind is a is a mindset game and i think with all the learning that's been put out there not enough attention is being given to how do people develop an anti fragile mindset how do we how do they up their game so that when the world comes back to whatever the new normal is yes that they're able to function and they're able to sort of hit the ground running in this new context and this uh, you know in this new environment good points i'm going to turn this over to dr rao dr rao what is your sense on what is happening in the space of learning at this point because a lot of organizations want to invest in it um you know but it seems to be some generic stuff that seems to be available i'm just trying to figure like to 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 um bosco's point um the need for wanting to be able to address real pain points through learning uh, at this time because like we're saying that we have the responsibility of preparing people for a new world so what is your reaction to that yeah i will respond to a couple of other points that were made earlier the first point was that every time there is an issue like this hr becomes a victim boy i think the reason is we have lifted up hr nobody talks of any other profession they only talk of hr why this is because expectations are high we said hr is a is a philosophy is a way of life but if some people treat hr as a job you are doing a great job i think that is what the whole point of this thing is that you are only doing what you are asked to do so you are doing a great job so i don't think anyone should be disappointed if some people uh, are critical about hr this is because of high expectations in fact in one of my articles i said hr should think even ahead of the ceo that is the level to which we are at second issue i have a feeling which relates both to uh, work from home as well as uh, the learning and development issue that you talked about i think it's a little too early to come to any conclusions either about uh, formulating policies on work from home because we are all experiencing it will take time what we need to do is a thorough research because every organization has its own kind of work from home for it is not new whereas for a manufacturing company it has its own peculiarities even in manufacturing i think for certain functions it has its own peculiar peculiarities so it is for hr to do good research and come up with what are the kind of how do we create conditions where work from home is helpful and or what conditions for what kind of people it doesn't suit and you should be able to come up with a diverse policy because in fact i am afraid of policies if you come up with a policy what happens is hr the very hr which formulated policies uses it sometimes and it could demotivate people so i don't want to rush into policies either about learning and od or about uh, so it is we are all going through a very uh, dicey situation let us wait for it keep your eyes and ears open and keep researching as far as the learning space is concerned i think people are fascinated by the opening of the technology people who have not used zoom for example i myself have not used zoom until about a month ago and i think it is very nice to participate in zoom seminars and so on so i think it has become a right now i think people are experimenting i like to attend webinars i like to listen to people i am acquiring something so i think you wait it all any development organizationally driven has got to be planned i think it is a little too early maybe wait for a month or two i think hr people all that they should do is use this opportunity to research document and sensitize themselves so that they are able to come up with right kind of moves a month from now two months from now and i think what unfortunately is missing in hr is this research orientation sensitization collecting data using data and then come up with uh, whatever i think if you want to come up with policies with flexibility creating that so i am i am quite happy with whatever is happening opening up of the space for learning fantastic in fact i have choices to make uh, right now i think when we are talking here there is a hrd network uh, zoom webinar is going on uh, and then there are several other kind of things you make choices it's wonderful to have to make choices and do what what is best for you but this is mind you this is 
self directed learning soon you will move on to organization directed learning which is going to be competency based those competencies we are still not sure because every organization has to work out its own future yeah yeah that's true it's still work in progress in a way and i kind of endorse what you're saying here um having said that you know i think being able to do the research around the policies and perhaps even the agreements may be a great idea to avoid some of the challenges that you are experiencing and the pain points you experience was experiencing but with adequate research that dr tv rao was talking about uh, i just want to be able to do a quick uh, time check we have about 5 minutes to go um and i'm very sure we're going to have to extend this webinar so i'm just checking with the audience whether you're okay because we perhaps need another 5 or 10 minutes uh, to talk to the um to the uh, panelists and then we'll open it up to q and a with the audience uh so this is likely to go to 4:15 4:15 maybe 4:10 so uh we're going to carry on this conversation i hope that's all right with the panelists are you all good on time if we go to 4:15 all right great stuff so i'm going to ask the next question and this time it's to anuradha what is your sense on what kind of leadership development is organizations investing in i know there are organizations that are already willing to want to start looking at this um to to dr tv rao's point do we have clarity emerging on which kind of competencies we're going to need more of um how do we want to build this anti fragile kind of mindset uh for our leaders there are organizations already willing to be able to start exploring that they want to start doing that they want to make it meaningful they want to make it pertinent give me some sense on what you're you're already trying to do in the leadership space i do know it's going to be helpful to lots of people because even through the hr response team we've often had questions around that which is how can we engage our leadership teams um through learning and development what should we be focusing on at this time and uh, what are other organizations doing so i'm just trying to use the opportunity to ask both you and shobha to be able to share what can be pertinent at this time what are organizations already trying to do in the leadership development space so um in terms of leadership development what we have been doing the uh, in the last 5 weeks rather uh, since we've been in the lockdown is to see what is most important right now how are uh, how is leadership really walking the talk right so one of the things that we've done extensively is around communication how do you communicate effectively with a lot of compassion and with a lot of emotional intelligence that's number 1 number 2 what we've started doing is how do you build trust with teams now we've always been in a organization set up where you worked face to face where you had opportunities to manage people uh, through productivity measures matrices and everything today we're still figuring out how matrices will work we're still trying to figure out certain things uh, uh, which was very natural when you're working in office so uh, trust plays a very very uh, uh, strong uh, uh, part in uh, ensuring that productivity is managed responsibility is managed one of the other things that i have discovered lately is very basic management concepts like management by objective we seem to have forgotten these concepts which we read in our uh, course books during mba and it's it's beautiful when we bring it back to the leadership team and there's a aha moment where people say yes we could have used it why did we not think of it so these very basic concepts which i have been discovering over the last 5 uh, five weeks which people seem to have forgotten things like how do you create value in your organization by doing small incremental pieces right so bringing all of this back to leadership saying that what is it that you can do right now to manage the situation number one and largely another piece which i would like to look at from a leadership uh, uh, competency development uh, perspective would be foresight and strategy are you preparing yourself for the large vuka world which you have not experienced till now and we don't even know what that world is going to look like so how a child are you do you understand everything do you have a framework in mind which fits every problem when you get a solution rather than going down to understanding what this problem is breaking it down so in my uh, experience i've always found a management concept or a framework working really well when you're dealing with uh, uh, unknown problems yeah. so these are certain areas which i have been concentrating on super i'm going to move this over to shobha and i know shobha handles diversity and inclusion for india and some of the countries of uh, john deere um uh, shobha how are you using the um, you know the kind of um, 
movement to build a diverse and inclusive culture how, what what are what are what are organizations like yours doing with it uh, in the times of a crisis so i mean these are beautiful times to be able to reiterate um the power of diversity the power of inclusion to be able to solve problems to improve the right kind of people to perhaps bust some of the inner circles that we ended up creating inadvertently or otherwise within organizations i'd be delighted if you regale the audience with some of the insights on the dni space on how the momentum on that can actually help you yeah. get your arms around the ch new challenges that organizations are experiencing at this time uh thank you sujaya i think i'll uh, just make two contradictory statements when it comes to first i think the leadership development so the first statement is that nothing has changed and the uh, second statement is that everything has changed and now let me explain these two statements to you uh, uh, so i'll just tell you our competency framework is very very broad uh, and we're just looking at three things one is that fulfilling the mission so you can call it running the railroad business as usual the second is leading change and the third one is creating the future and i think uh, dr rao and bosco has added some great significant points on what hr should be doing we are uh, dealing uh, in our own way now coming to your question of diversity and inclusion uh, sujaya like i said so when it comes to fulfilling the mission we did not change anything we said that we want to go ahead with the set plan so we very recently launched our uh, men as diversity partner journey which is a long four month long journey with classroom interventions and so nothing changed on that front the journey is on but everything changed from classroom we've migrated to a virtual format and so ji is smiling because she is partnering with us on that journey and we had an exceptional participation because i think the uh, country top team coming together and talking about these aspects finding time in current times to you know where there is pressure of resumption of operations we are into agri business but despite all that coming together taking up the conversations on unconscious bias and the kind of culture we want to set up i think those things have not changed so uh, that's why i said i'll make two contradictory statements uh, besides uh, i just want to add uh, sujaya that the current talent management team and i know some of my team members are here on the call as well uh, they are working on a talent management 2.0 version what will that look like uh, uh will it be hr running like headless chicken and running uh, learning more like a engagement and a initiatives program that this show that show and things like that and the answer to do it is very clear no we are doing meaningful intervention and uh, uh like dr rao mentioned that we are looking at competency based micro learning platforms uh, in internally and we are engaging a lot of internal leaders to do these sessions by helping uh, them to create content partnering with learning partners to have the content and have them deliver because their sense of internal org realities is exceptional it's better than anybody else in current times so i'll pause there uh, i hope this answers your question and i did not uh, too much segue here and there no no not at all i think it was great and i think i want to be able to with that move forward into asking what else um, are we seeing happen around uh, talent management and i mean particularly interested in the high potential programs because they get started with much fanfare and then deserted whenever it suits us especially if there's a crisis i'm just saying what's really going on with the high potential program are we using these times well to be able to groom these future leaders are there indeed new future leaders emerging as a result of the crisis so i'm just wondering how closely are we watching this because um you know more often than not the processes that we have for identifying potential are highly questionable inside many organizations and it's part the reason why more often than not we can end up having egg in our face for having identified people as high potential who don't really stack up when there is a crisis so i'm just trying to figure how well are you using this to be able to identify new levels of leadership or perhaps a uh, new people who emerge as heroes in these times can i go on this uh, yes, yes please yes please okay so i'm trying to put a little bit of an objective uh, into this just for paucity of time uh, mm. if i were to look at it, the organizational mindset will go through three levels yeah and mm. it's a choice that organizations make mm. they will go through process of survival mm. they will go through a process of level 0 just come to you know wherever they are try to achieve mm. you know what they have lost cover ground mm. and the mm. third one is excel i mean excel from where they are they're seeing this as an opportunity so i repeat mm. survival level and excel as organizational mindset mm. the question about talent on the other side as people in the organization respond to this entire organizational mindset mm. 
I want to bring it back to the bedrock of culture, capability and contribution, which becomes the foundation mm-hmm. on which you're going to deeply anchor. Mm-hmm. People's response to this and in the way the talent management or the talent architecture, new talent architecture that will evolve, will again come into three definitive layers in my view. Number one, clearly doers who are mm. just responding and we, we yes. spoke about this, you know, the entire first 30 minutes. It yes. could be effective doers, people who are seeing slightly better, the haziness of the moving goalposts, they're able to see slightly better and they're able to respond and navigate the entire processes and the system and take some chances. There will be those two person definite value creators who are ahead yeah. of the rest. And that yeah. is where the talent one will respond to. The yeah. conventional nine by nine, whatever we have been doing, will need to move to this entire enterprise or business value creators. Mm. And the capabilities that you you know alluded to in the previous question, again, I just want to take that. Yeah. And I'm yeah. seeing three major capabilities that will be needed to really respond to this. Mm. Number one, transformation management transformation management of this kind of magnitude has never been dealt with number one yeah, yeah. number two digital i mean digital i think is a new way of life all, all and we can speak you know enough hours in that and the third one is the entire part of you know somewhere we started even pre this call which is the emotional intelligence where we're bringing the entire high tech high touch and dealing with it emotional intelligence so there's a three by three on the entire stuff as we were speaking this, you know, uh, during this conversation, I built it in my own head. Possibly yeah. I'll, I'll draw out something and send it out yeah. to you. Maybe useful. Yeah. I'll yeah. pause. I know I can okay. expand on each of those. Yeah. But just for want of time, we'll pause yeah. here. Yeah. Thank but you. I think be- be- beautifully said. And thank you for sharing that. And I think you must uh, must translate what is crystallizing in your head because it's sounding, uh, it's sounding fantastic. I want to be able to bring this very vibrant conversation to a closure so that we can try and start uh, getting some questions on board by asking Bosco and uh, Dr. T.B. Rao, um, what do you see um, emerging um, uh, as, um, as trends in terms of culture shifts? Um, you know, what are you seeing uh, happen in terms of already organizations are experiencing distributed authority? So really the sort of melting down of command and control styles very significantly as a result of the crisis. Um, you know, there are many other shifts that can very, um, that can kind of, the ones we were not getting ahead before the COVID-19 crisis, you know, we're struggling with, um, you know, whether it's uh, more empowerment, uh, you know, more voice, uh, less of group think, many of those challenges that organizations were struggling with, um, you know, we're already hearing stories about how all of that is diluting, uh, you know, there are IT projects which were taking years, uh, you know, to complete, which have suddenly pivoted and you have in the last three weeks there are there are there is more digitization that organizations have experienced than ever before uh, lots of incredible shared mindsets more cooperation greater collaboration across teams and so on what other shifts are you seeing happening what can people really expect can easily be the positive outcome in terms of culture from a crisis of this kind? dr rao would you like to yeah uh, dr okay. rao well uh it's a little difficult. Uh, two months is uh, too much of a too short a time to be able to. But what I, I see yes. certainly collaboration has increased. Yes. The culture of uh, saying earlier, this is not my job, has gone because yeah. now it is everybody's job. So I think multi-skilling, yeah. that kind yeah. of a thing starts. Everyone is talking about compassion. I'm not very sure how much we are able to practice it finally. But I think this is this has got to be the kind of the future. Yeah. In terms yeah. of this. So a culture of equality, culture of compassion, culture uh, focusing on uh, respect for every human being, what we traditionally called as octopus values, openness, yeah. everyone can give an idea, particularly those who are under stress. If only they can use all the people whom they are going to ask to leave to get their views on what is the way I think the company can go forward. I think this yes. is like to see companies who can do that. Just don't throw people away. Get them to pose your problem to them and get them to talk. I think Octopace offers a great solution, great opportunity. Collaboration is certainly going on. I'm not very sure if confrontation is going on. A lot of I like to see a lot of experimentation and so on. So all that I can see is quite a bit of talk of compassion, empathy, equality, uh, integration, and so on. This is the kind of a culture that is emerging, and I wish this this culture gets strengthened. 
and continues and there will be a great future for organizations absolutely thank you i think we'll move that over to bosco bosco what is your sense so <clears throat> i think like uh, dr rao says it's early days yet sujay we are certainly seeing some changes happening uh, don't know whether these will sustain post covid when we go back to the new normal because we human beings have a great tendency to jump right back into the world we know but certainly what i see from uh, clients uh, right now what's going on is that you know, there is a great emphasis on the relational aspect of leadership leaders are really being asked to step up and lead this time because this is a time when people want hope mm. they need to know what the future is going to look like and leaders right. don't, don't have the answer but they're expected to lead they're expected to show up yes, yes. what we are seeing is that rajesh uh, talked about emotional intelligence that's certainly one component of it but we are yes. seeing that you know the traditional transactional fast paced leaders are being are being forced to slow down are being forced to slow down and actually connect with people talk to people give them hope collaborate with others uh, you know it reminds me of uh, i think in the pre covid era the focus for traditionally for leadership has been on the masculine competencies you know the mm. strategy vision drive goal etc etc mm. what we think coming into play now are the hitherto feminine competencies or the soft skills which are actually it's a misnomer because these are the hardest skills to build so the feminine competence yeah. of compassion listening you know working with people yes. supporting empathy that's what's being called into play now yeah. and leaders some of them are being forced yes. to sort of acquire these competencies because that's the only way you can how do you bring people together in a time like this when there's fear you know there's kind of a corporate ptsd so leaders are being forced to to do things that they yeah. want to do and these competencies i think will be required even post uh, you know covid of relating yes. empathy connecting because that's the yeah. only thing that keep teams and people coherent when the next crisis hits no? yes we will be asking ourselves oh what did we do at that time that worked no? mm. these are the competencies that are actually critical for us to build into our competency frameworks and actually it required over emphasize on them at this point in time because that's what's keeping people sane that's what giving people so leaders have to step out of themselves and connect right. and relate to people point i think with that is a very deep audience which is students so i'm going to take a couple of questions with your permission because i don't uh, rajesh someone asked what are the three c's again so while i roll off the questions and start asking if you can repeat the three c's some people wanted to know can you repeat the three c's for us please culture capabilities and contribution so i'm moving out of performance which is a measurement of effort contribution is outcome so today when we are in a situation where you know we are not talking of performance but it's finally hard numbers that's talking so translate performance to contribution easy to remember right um so there's an interesting question here is asking sorry sorry rajesh i think you have a you have kind of a unstable line so we can't hear you very clearly all right you've got the three c's so i'm just going to go forward with asking the questions there's a nice interesting question here which says if the chro has been a trusted advisor and people champion then the employee experience would have been kept sacred what would you recommend to make such hr leaders to become anti fragile what the article is saying is there any suggestions any of the panelists have how can hr hr leaders become anti fragile uh so ja i can go uh, and i i do yes. you, yes, please please do. i do want to let the participants and the panelists know that i'm personally going through imposter syndrome right now uh and i want to yes. acknowledge that you know, i find it sometimes very hard among the such a capable panel which is sitting here but i'll still i'll go first and quickly respond to that 
um i i yeah. think the, uh, vistri has recommended some great insights on how to be anti fragile as a chro uh, but my personal take as in not only chro but as a chr professional i think it is important and i'll just build on from what tv uh, so mentioned that it is important that we are bringing the right practices because someone in the chat box also mentioned that you know uh, small firms uh, owner led businesses how does hr kind of propose change and challenges so if you are able to bring uh, and next practice because that's where i think hr will stand apart and stand out because current time is a time full of opportunities so bringing the best practices up and having conviction for that and that will only come from the research which you will do uh, the, and that will give you confidence to kind of suggest uh, solutions in the current times so that's surely one aspect which i wanted to add uh, besides this is that okay great fantastic i'm going to ask the next question this comes from ajay venkatesh and he's asking uh, professor tv rao that you know peter drop has said that if you want something new you have to stop doing something old why are hr folks not ready to embrace the new in an agile manner they keep doing the same old thing again and again what change have you noticed in india what do hr professionals need to develop on during these times which they're not doing already is what he's asking very very good question i am a strong believer in uh, the need for change and also i think vijay govind raj uh, has come up with this strategy that uh, uh, at least 20% of what you do every year should be discontinued in fact i would even put a, a lot more of that forget the past always live in the present forget the past at least in certain kind of areas now why hr people are not able to do i think they have lived some of the hr people have lived too long in a legalistic uh, framework of hr and highly task oriented framework of hr that is one of the reasons they have enjoyed for too long that may be one of the reasons why they are not able to get out of the mindset now what should be done i i think the most important thing for me is for hr to rediscover itself i like this uh, comment which was made a few years ago by the sadguru jaggi was there when he said human is not a resource it's crime to call it a resource because all resources are measurable the moment you measure something it limits the capability is that call it human possibilities 30 years ago when somebody said human is not a resource i used it to pound sun yeah. but today i feel that i think that is the, that's where the problem was we have dropped human from hrd which are and development from hrd and only resource so first thing i would recommend for all hr people is please look at every single employee as a possibility they can contribute a hell of a lot if you can get out of the old mindset you are a resource i will put you in a box you are you are there to achieve targets kras kpas and that is where i think a phenomenal amount of change is required in talent management today we have to throw out some of the principles we have used when they come up with utterly new practices focusing on the human possibilities what a human being can do including the migratory labor why not i mean they can do phenomenal thing can you imagine people work, walking for 1500 kilometers wait with patients for two months and then finally when they could get can any one of us do this i think there is a lot to learn i wish all hr managers do this 500 km walk <laughs> good one uh, i'm going to ask this yeah i'm going to ask this add, uh, a comment yes so uh, just to add and build on what dr rao is saying i'm reminded of a comment by peter hawkins who's one of the pioneers of systemic coaching he uh, introduced this term called future back mm. and i think it would be pertinent for hr to ask this question of themselves what is the organization and the people in the organization going to need 5 years from today which we will regret not having acted upon today yeah and start building on that yeah you know someone was just to your point uh, bosco someone was telling me that uh, you know hundreds of organizations had a vision 2020 and uh, given the current scenario a lot of what it is that was planned as future that we're working towards is this is the future that we've landed into uh, where most people say we could never have been prepared for this but i think you're making a good point which is you know what is it that we'd like to do today which we won't regret 5 years later that we didn't think about it today so i think good point and i'm going to park that 
I have a question here from Faiz Nomani, and I'm going to direct this to um, to uh, I'm going to direct this to Rajesh Padmanabh. He, she say, I think Faiz is a is a, is a woman, but I don't know. So Faiz says, when companies have decided to manage the cash flow situations by letting go of people or cutting costs, the decisions are done at the CXO or the founder level. HR is typically involved as a messenger of communication. How can we get HR to play a more significant role in these? major decisions that are being made uh, in the space of being able to cut back or rationalize manpower uh, in the context of perhaps uh, resources not available in the future or like they stay managing cash flow situations uh, and cost cutting uh, you know actions that are that are integral to the survival of the organization the question is what role can hr how can we expand the role hr plays to influence some of these decisions Excellent uh, question and a great question. I mean, touching some of the nerves in my system. Uh, this is what I've been advocating for some time. You know, in a situation like this, what I define as quantitation, I think Dr. Rock clearly said the human part of it and the development part of it is, you know, moved away and only the resourcing part of it is left. So the hard part of it, which needs to be dealt with strategy, the real business, I'm dealing with it as you know two parts that have got to touch the PNL and two parts that have got to touch the balance sheet. Only then you get the balance as far as the quantification of the quantity is concerned. Whatever is touching the PNL as far as people costs are concerned, your, your, your salary, wages, and all of them are typically the PNL stuff which you need to be aware of, which is where the impact is felt at the top line, at the bottom line, you know, a significant contribution to EBITDA and all that comes under pressure in situations like this, which is actually putting the entire system under stress. But having dealt with this, I think the capabilities of an effective CHRO who understands how to channelize people's spends between people, p &L, and the balance sheet, which is what the capability building is all about, which is the balance sheet item. So eventually, how do you manage capital and costs and spends? How do you bifurcate them? How do you do some kinds of takeaway, which may be the need at the hour, but how do you channelize that into development or into balance sheet is the real answer. And there is no work that has ever been done in this space, space except for some amount of skill quantification. So there is an opportunity. It's an, it's a completely untraveled uh, road, but clearly this also puts the, the, the HR professionals in the forefront of true business partnering, which we've been talking about for so many decades. I think we need to jump into some of those quantifications right now to make sense out of what this is all about. So it's a right mix of the soft and the hard skills that they need to really bring into play. And only then you see a clear journey forward. So I think that's the way I would look at it, but happy to respond to this a little more in a detailed manner. If you were to connect with me offline, but I think business understanding and really knowing the numbers, understanding strategy, understanding business, understanding the numbers and understanding transformation, while the goalposts are still moving, will be some of the new skills that a CHRO will be exposed to and the team as well. Right. Good, good points, uh, Rajesh. You have very effusive reactions to what it is that you're saying on the chat. In fact, for all of you, uh, I'm going to pose a last question and we'll try and close it uh, at this point, um, you know, I'm going to leave it with the two ladies, right? So I'm going to get Anuradha and uh, Shobha to go on this one. There was a question on the, um, in the Q&A segment saying that we're very quick to talk about what capabilities the organization needs and what competencies do our leaders need and what should we be doing across the board. And we, we're very, very busy planning all of this and thinking about all this. What capabilities do, do HR need in the new environment? And what's your take on what to be in HR, whether in learning, talent management, coding? What, what capabilities do we need? Which new capabilities do you think we need that should equip an HR team to be able to manage these unprecedented new times? Uh, I'd like to go first on that one. Uh, when you look at the new times, I don't think the old times and new times have changed much for HR as such. Uh, you go to an HR professional and they would say, oh, I've been managing fire. And today also they say, oh, I've been managing fire. What we need to understand is managing fire is not about just moving the paper here and there. The biggest chance that HR has today is to have business acumen. Understand what is business. Understand what drives business. 
if we know where to put the buck, we will know where to move uh, development efforts as well. If we know what's moving business, we will know where we have to move. So for example, when I look at my organization today, there's a lot of uh, you know, similar conversation happening in the organization saying, where are we going to go next? What is the new norm? All of that. But today, possibly we're doing those conversations to say that in two years time, what is the talent that you want to develop? And this hasn't changed for me. I've been doing this conversation even two years back, tr you know, trying to understand what 2020 would look like. I do want to understand what 2022 will look like and how do I then deal with 2022 differently, right? So uh, the biggest thing that we need to understand is how is business moving? What is most important for business? And then, uh, you know, make our solutions which are relevant to business. And if uh, HR professionals start understanding that, it'll become much easier for all of us. Great stuff. Uh, Shobha, what is your response to this? What do HR professionals need to develop? So yeah, I have two points to make, but I'll first quickly narrate the, I don't know if you've all seen the Harvard cartoon, which was there very recently, or maybe it is old, I saw it very recently. So there's a cartoon where uh, there's a whole boardroom people sitting there and looking at, you know, a graph moving and they're telling that, you know, our Facebook likes and our LinkedIn likes are very high. And there is a euphoria in the room. And at the bottom, there is a quote saying that, you know, but why is our market share not growing? So I just want to kind of uh, uh, lead that, you know, what An Anuradha made a point that it's been extremely important in current times to, for HR to understand business and partner at the right places to see that, you know, where we can enable and help. So I think that's something which is just a uh, must. I think the second point which I was wanting to make is picking from uh, Dr. Rao's mention of uh, 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 Dr. Govind Rajlu's three box model. He spoke about doing new stuff and creating future possibilities, but one box is also about what are you stopping to do? And I think we as HR are a uh, little terrible at stopping to do certain things. Once we start something, we want to lead it like a legacy and keep going forward. So the capability question which I want to respond in one word is learning agility. Uh, you can go and read up on that. It has got mental agility, people agility. And I think everything comes together with that one competency, which is most critical for HR more than ever before is learning agility. I'll pause here. Thank you. All right. Super. So I'm going to ask all of you a question, which is give me, um, and it's going to be a rapid fire. So I'm going to ask all of you to say something to the audience around, you know, Josh Person says these are incredible times for HR to emerge as the real heroes of this crisis. So I'm going to now contrast this with Visti's article that we read early in the morning, which is really asking some very pertinent questions around courage and fragility and resilience and the rest of that. I'm going to turn this around to say, you know, give me a last comment on how you believe HR can become the hero of these times. So Dr. Rao, should we start with you? What did you say? How HR can become? The real hero of, this, of these times. Real hero. Okay. Oh, wonderful. I think first I think have faith in yourself. You have to have tremendous faith. And number two, have faith in other people. People can do wonderful things. Irrespective of caste, community, designation, richness, poorness, anyone, every human being can do a lot. So I think have faith in yourself and believe in other people. Thank you. Lovely. Anuradha, would you like to go next? Uh, my two points would be first is courage. Yeah, all HR professionals need to have courage. Second is ask the right questions. If we can ask the right questions and guide the organization in the right direction, I think we uh, there's nothing more that we can uh, do better. Good point. Great point. Rajesh, what can make the HR emerge as the real hero of these times? Tenacity. Resilience and transformation. I just, just give me 30 seconds more. Uh, I truly believe, I truly believe this is the stage of people transformation. It is as big as possibly what we saw as industrialization, economic growth. We saw automation, uh, the IT wave. And the last one that we saw was digital. I think this is going to be another big revolution of its kind because every single individual, irrespective of whatever in, in, in life, uh, let's, let's park the work part of it, is undergoing yeah. transformation. Yeah. Workplaces yeah. are undergoing transformation, so teams, organization. I think we are at the center of 
this entire transformation. Self-belief, resilience, tenacity, and having the ability to transform with deep understanding of business will make all the difference. And that's exactly the reason I see COVIDization as an opportunity to transform the world through people. Super, and amen to that. Uh, Shobha, do you think we're on the threshold of an inflection point in terms of finally getting this, the place on the table, finally being valued for our wisdom, being seen as the trusted advisor, is this the chance for us to be able to do that? As a one uh, word answer is absolutely yes, Sujaya. Uh, I have been always inspired by the book by Malcolm Gladwell, which is Outliers. And I'll just uh, say that, you know, we finally are the sum of opportunities which we get. And I think never before opportunity, we kept hearing on incredible time. So I think we uh, HR needs to look at this as an opportunity. And I just want to leave with a quote, which is opportunity is seldom knocks the door and it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. Like work. So get, yeah, so get going. <laughs> so grab that opportunity and get going uh, is what my message will be. Thank you, Sujaya, for the opportunity. Great one. Thank you, Shobha. Uh, Bosco, you, you get to have the last word. Okay, so I'll, be, I'll make this really quick. My request to HR would be, uh, you know, the, the Latin phrase, carpe diem, seize the day. The, you know, there is the opportunity. And I would, I would say three things. One is to move from silo thinking to systemic thinking. That how do we represent all voices in the room? How do we bring in people who have been marginalized? How we bring in, uh, HR can be that inflection point where all the voices come in so that you're looking at a wider view of the system and not just a narrow view. Number yeah. two is how can HR use this opportunity to cascade learning into the day-to-day -day experience of people? Not treat learning as an event or an offsite or a training program, but build it into the day-to-day -day experience of people. Like organizations like Google have done by building coaching as a managerial competency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm glad you raised this because I must make a point here that I'm working closely with an organization that is using this time to create mentoring, to institutionalize mentoring within the organization. And I think it's such brilliant thinking to say yeah. if we actually convert all our leaders into mentors at this time, you'll actually get the agility, the empowerment, the movement, the kind of um, speed at which you want decision making, you get better alignment, you'll get inclusion, you'll get innovation because you're bringing the right kind of ideas. So I completely uh, endorse what you're saying here. I think these are incredible times to be able to integrate some of these HR processes. So the thank you for saying that. Right. And the yeah. third thing I would, I would say to HR is be bold. You know, we have fantastic resources out there. Uh, sometimes it's, it's easy to feel, okay, we don't have the money, we don't have the budgets right now. So let's not bring in this resource or that resource. But these are times when people are willing to look beyond money. So be bold. If you see a great resource that you think will be useful for your organization, be bold, go out there, tell them, you know, would, we'd like you to be part of this journey. And I'm 100% I'm sure 80 out of 100 people will want to be part of that journey. Yeah, good point. So I think these are times of crisis and I think it's incredible to see shared mindsets, people coming together, people rallying around. And like I was saying, you know, we need hard fun mollas inside organizations. People who are willing to do what it takes to be able to make things happen. So I think this has been an incredible conversation. Thank you, each one of you. There are effusive comments galore in the chat. I must tell you that we've not seen such overflowing numbers of comments and all very, very uh, full of praise for each one of you. You really have been an incredible panel. So thank you for making this conversation so great. You know, we're at uh, 90 minutes and no one seems to want to leave. So I think that's like a great compliment. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming in on board, sharing your insights, staying on to be able to answer these questions. Um, Shobha, someone's asking about the names of the books that you talked about. So I'm saying Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers. Is there anything else that you want to refer to? They say they want to know which books did you talk about. I, that's the book. I think you, you just said it. That's yeah. All right, great. So fantastic, everyone. Thank you for being on board. Uh, you know, we keep the conversation going. But I think for now, this is the third in our, in our talent management and cultural leadership series. You've just brought it to a crescendo, really. So thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for your generosity with which you shared your insights. We really enjoyed having you on board. Uh, I think with that, we bring the conversation to a closure and hopefully to be able to catch up with all of you again another time. So thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thanks for being on this panel. 
and uh, you know keep in touch like i said the hr response team the dni study of uh, stay in touch with us join us members so that you're constantly part of this journey called the learning in od roundtable thank you everybody take care and be safe thank, thank you